astronauts join three other crew members already on the space station to carry out experiments and space walks. And that is Afternoon Live. I'm Kim Landers. Thanks for joining us. There will be more news in 15 minutes. Up next, though, it's Capitol Hill. Welcome to Capitol Hill. I'm Lyndall Curtis. All may not be well with the government's deal with the Liberal Party on increased taxpayer support for political parties. Labor is confident it has bipartisan support, but some Liberals are uneasy with the deal and the Nationals are understood to be overwhelmingly opposed and are talking to their coalition colleagues about it today. The deal delivered an extra dollar per vote to cover administrative costs and even the funding garnered by the votes which went to Craig Thompson and Peter Slipper will go to the parties they've since left. Leaving too is former Minister Martin Ferguson, who announced this afternoon he's quitting politics at the next election. Joining me near the end of this busy day are Liberal MP Jane Prentice and Labor MP Joel Fitzgibbon. Welcome to you both. Thanks, Thank you, Lyndall. We'll begin with the public funding of political parties and with the Attorney General confirming parties will benefit from the votes at election time for their now former MPs. We don't suggest that um, the Liberal National Party of Queensland should return the election funding that went to them after the 2010 election uh, because Mr Peter Slipper has left the Liberal National Party of Queensland. So Joel, uh, increased taxpayer f support for political parties at a time when you're cutting in the budget, is this a popular move? Well I know what Sir Humphrey would have said, Lyndall. Courageous? Very courageous Minister, very courageous. Oh look, it's controversial and uh, every MP uh, will be getting complaints in their electorate offices uh, throughout the course of this week. I certainly am. Um, you know, I'm concentrating on policy and things that are important to my electorate. I'll leave it to the party apparatchiks to fight this one out. Can you understand why it's being done now? Uh, I'm not here to defend or um, explain the timing. Uh, obviously, you know, only a few months out from an election, the, the timing could have been uh, better, but look, I, I, I understand the other side of the argument too. I mean, we uh, we want a healthy, strong democracy. We don't want to go the, down the path of the United States, where you literally need to be wealthy to uh, run for parliament or the Congress. In their case, so there there is two sides of the story. We've always had public funding underpinning uh, our democracy, and we'll continue to, to do so. But yeah, there's a question about timing, and I understand why people in the electorates uh, won't be very impressed. Jane, do you know if coalition support or Liberal Party support for this is guaranteed? Well, Lyndall, we haven't seen the details of the bill or the legislation, and more importantly, we haven't had time to discuss it in party room yet. So uh, we've got a way to go, and uh, there are quite a few issues around it that I know members want to discuss uh, in a frank and uh, sort of confidential way. Are you concerned about the possible public reaction to it? Well, I think uh, the, the public reaction is the same as the reaction from some of the members and, you know, issues about retrospectivity. Um, some members suggest, well, if we're discussing this, why aren't we discussing other issues around electioneering as well? You know, so Queensland introduced a cap on what we spend. Should that be on the table for discussion as well? So I think the members uh, want to have the discussion and that's ahead of us. So it's not something I'd like to see rush through by any stretch of the imagination. As Joel said, we do have bipartisan agreement on public funding. Uh, but I'm yet to see agreement on, on this legislation. Once again, we haven't got the details. Would, would, you, would you vote against it even if your party machinery supported it? Well, I don't know what 
We're voting against you, but I haven't seen it. So we, we do need to look at it and discuss it. Joel, that point Jane raised about, about what's happened in Queensland, in the Green Paper that John Faulkner produced on election funding reform, as part of the discussion, it talked about in order to, to get public support, there was a case for looking at uh, limiting the, the growth in donations and campaign spending. Do you think trade-offs like that, if people feel that, uh, that the intrusion of politicians into their lives, particularly mm -hmm. at election time, is being, is being constrained, that that would increase public support for more public funding for well, the parties? Well, to be honest, you know, this is not an area of, area of expertise for me. I don't take that much notice of it. Uh, fundraising is a necessary evil in politics, uh, we all do it, we all by necessity rely upon it. You know, this debate has largely been about the threshold for declaring donations. If it were practical in, in a sort of paperwork sense, I'd be happy for the threshold to be one dollar. You know, I don't have any qualms about declaring every cent that I receive from anyone. Um, uh, the public funding side, of course, is what is making it controversial and, and it's a difficult one for both parties. We might move on now to national security. It's been a hot topic on a number of fronts. The reports the plans for the new ASIO building were hacked and questions about funding for ASIO and the Office of National Assessments. The opposition took the unusual step today of directing a question to the Labor backbencher and chair of the Intelligence Committee who'd raised concerns earlier this week about funding, although it didn't go as well as the opposition had expected. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I have nothing further to add to the statement that I have made, but I, um, I do flag a concern here. I take my job as Chair of the, National, the, uh, the Parliamentary Joint Intelligence Committee very seriously. What I have observed and what concerns me with respect to the conduct of the Leader of the Opposition and the Opposition in the past couple of days is this. That committee report, uh, report was a joint report. It was a unanimous report. It was a report by consensus on two sides. I've never seen in this place in my entire time, with one exception, national security just thrown around like it's a political plaything. And I accuse you, opposition leader, of doing so. You are the least qualified opposition leader to talk about matters of national security since Mark Latham. Uh, Joel, there are a number of serious issues to talk about. But first, uh, is Mark Latham now the highest insult you can throw at someone? <laughs> oh, look, uh, I thought it was a great performance from Anthony Byrne. He showed himself to be ministerial material today, so uh, all power and strength to him. And you're right, it did backfire on the opposition. Anthony Byrne had a good answer and good on him. Uh, Jane, the opposition's been pursuing the issue of national security on a number of fronts, uh, particularly the discussion about funding, but also tying the issue of funding for ASIO to the issue of asylum seekers. Do you need to be wary about trying to make too much political capital out of what is a, always a sensitive area. But the political issue that we do need to discuss is funding and resourcing for ASIO. At a time when there's never been so much demand on their services, it is not the time to cut their funding. But can, can I just say, Jane, I mean, you've had three years or, in fact, almost six years to have a go at the government on some of these national security issues, whether it be defence or our intelligence agencies, and you've done nothing, but you saw a political opportunity out of the, the, the allegations about the cyber security breach in Asia, and suddenly it's the biggest no, issue on your plate. No, no, I mean, the issue we're discussing first is nice. the funding. And I think every budget, when you cut the funding every year, we do say something. We no, do. no, no. And I'm sorry, Jane. You've never asked a question on any of these issues we before. We have always complained you saw a about funding cuts. I'm not, no. I might just divert you for one moment because the, the Attorney General also criticised his opposition counterpart, George Brandis, today for speaking perhaps a little too freely about a briefing he'd had from the Director General of ASIO on that question of whether the ASIO building plans were hacked. Did Senator Brandis make a mistake? Did he go too far? Should he have said anything about a briefing? Well, I think George, uh, Senator Brandis wanted to reassure everyone that he'd had a thorough briefing, that there was no way impugn in any criticism of ASIO or the Director General there, Mr Irvine. And uh, I think Senator Brandis made it very clear that the coalition were confident in the role ASIO had taken and the action they'd taken. And uh, I'm sure he didn't intend to go any past anything past that. You know, I think yeah. the opposition's made a bit of a sport of attacking senior public servants in Canada. Recently it was the Treasury and now they've uh, moved on to our well, it's the people who, in, in, but Joel, who Joel, have our intelligence. Joel, you'd, you'd, as a former Defence Minister, you'd understand the problems that 
occurring around the world with the with the question of hacking and whether whether states are engaged in it as well given the concern is there is there a right for the public to know or should the public be aware of exactly what's happening is it is it okay to maintain everything under the cloak of this is an operational matter and we don't talk about it oh, i think there's a level at which it is important that the public do understand what's happening i mean you know, we spend a lot of money on defence and security more generally every year, taxpayers' money, and they need to understand why that is important. There's no good arguing, you know, for a $30 billion outlay in this area every year if you're not going to explain why it's important that we be spending this money. So I think it is important to a point, but it's a fine line. You've got to be very, very careful not to cross the line into areas where you're talking about operational issues which could compromise. Uh, national security. The, the other question, of course, is funding for ASIO and, and a body like the Office of National Assessments. Funding has grown particularly since September 11. The ASIO building, I think, will be the second largest building in Canberra. Is it too sensitive to talk about whether, whether that level of funding is actually needed? No, no, I don't. I, I think, look, the 2009 white paper was very robust in its language, both on cyber security and, of course, on the growing role of China in the region. Now, some people criticised uh, us for that, for that, but you can't be spending all of this money uh, on what might, might be threats, might be threats, uh, without explaining to people that there are potential emerging instabilities in our region. I mean, it's very important. Uh, we, might now, we might now talk about the announcement by Martin Ferguson that he is retiring from politics. Jane, th there were some very generous comments from Tony Abbott. We don't often see that sort of thing about someone who's, who's on the opposite side. I think well deserved, Lyndall. I mean, Martin has been uh, an excellent minister and uh, very well respected by both sides of Parliament. We're uh, a bit stunned that such talent is actually sitting on the back bench. As he said, it's the first time he's ever been on the back bench as I understand Simon Crean and quite frankly we believe uh, there's more talent on the Labor backbench than there is on their front bench, mm -hmm. uh, including you Joel. Oh, uh, thank you, Jace. Because very, very helpful. Thank you. You've got McClelland, <laughs> you've got Bowen, you've got Richard Miles, there's a whole series of them. And Joel, was it a surprise to see him go given he'd recently become a backbencher? And not a shock but yes a surprise, in fact I was in his office not long before question time he said nothing to me. He's a great loss to the party, I, I'm prepared to say he's the the, the best Labor man never to lead the party. Uh, enormous contribution and full credit to Tony Abbott for his speech, but he was able to draw on such emotion on the basis of Martin's respect across the parliament and his contribution over many years. So farewell, Martin Ferguson. You, you will be a great loss to the party. We might uh, now leave with Martin Ferguson's announcement that he was, he was resigning and also Tony Abbott's response. When I look back on my career, firstly at the Miscellaneous Workers' Union, and then as ACDU President, and finally as a Member for Parliament, my main motivation has been to get Australians into decent, well-paying jobs. Amen. This is what the Labor Party means to me, helping those less fortunate in life by providing new jobs and opportunities to achieve a better quality of life. Feels unable to stay in the parliament. I regret that he felt unable to remain in the current government. The government, his party, the parliament and our country will be the poorer for his absence. Well may we shed a tear, Madam Speaker, for things which were, which should be, but which are not. And from this side of the political trench, I salute an honourable opponent and a great Australian. And that's where we'll leave Capitol Hill tonight. I'd like to thank my guests, Joel Fitzgibbon and Joan Prentice. Appreciate thank you very much for your time. We will be back tomorrow, but until then, good night.
she lived a vibrant and inspiring life, dignified to the end. I can always imagine her saying, what's all the fuss about? Almost a decade after revealing her diagnosis, Hazel Hawke's family share her final precious days. He sang Hazel's favourite song, like Danny Boy. Australian Story, Sunday. Sunday, with Whitlam in power, his passion takes flight. Our program's ambitious. He introduced the Racial Discrimination Act. The Supporting Mother's Benefits. But his biggest challenge... The Labor movement was split. ...is yet to come. You're not a particularly strong character. The stage is set. Comrade, we've been sacked. ...for the spectacular final act. I fear that there would have been blood. It's a fault line that has never healed. Whitlam, the power and the passion, concludes Sunday, 7.30. Hello, I'm James McHale and thanks for joining me for this national edition of ABC News. Today, election cash deal. The major political party is set for a $2 million windfall before September's election. Collingwood Club President Eddie Maguire apologises for an embarrassing on-air gaffe. So I'm here today to again publicly apologise to Adam Goods for the hurt that it caused him. And the US reveals plans for the joint strike fighter among those stolen by hackers. Also today, tributes for long-serving Labor frontbencher Martin Ferguson after he announced his intention to resign from politics. But first, the government hopes to rush its $1, one vote funding increase through the lower house within days. Labor's done a deal with the coalition to increase public funding for political parties. Crossbenchers are furious but won't be able to stop the legislation being passed. Political correspondent Greg Jennett reports. Looking like butchers, the trio from the Treasury portfolio aren't cutting to the bone. <laughs> Quite the opposite. Yep. They're accused of piling on the pork. I and the Labor Party have always stood for disclosure when it comes to campaign donations, for an element of public funding in the system so we can make the system work so it's not captured by big money. The political parties are set to pass a new law bolstering taxpayer funding by almost $30 million. A small instalment worth around $2 million would be backdated to April. Politicians are completely on the nose. Uh, this will just give an added level of stench uh, about politics and people's perception of politicians. All this at a time of budget cuts and deep deficits. This puts us uh, a smear and a slur on all of us and uh, uh, I just see what public opinion does. People aren't angry, people aren't disappointed, they're ashamed of, of this attempt at so-called political reform that looks like cartel behaviour and collusion. The major parties take the lion's share of the funding increase. Funding democracy is a very, very good thing to do and it is the bedrock of our society. But independents and any candidate who gets more than 4% of the vote also stand to gain. Parties, by their nature, um, have to run public offices. But there is one group that don't have party offices, and for them it goes to their back pocket, and they're called inde independents. The parties are at pains to point out that their funding increase can't be viewed in isolation. The bill would also bring greater transparency to political donations. But even seasoned campaigners are struggling to sell the message that now is the time for a big cash injection. This becomes part of the virtuous cycle of what we've designed in this bill. It increases the threshold of disclosure. Thank you very much. The House of Representatives could debate and pass the bill in just two days. Greg Jennett, ABC News, Canberra. For more, our political editor Lyndall Curtis joins us now. And Lyndall, the government said it struck a deal with the coalition on those changes to political funding. Are we seeing genuine good faith bipartisanship in work here? Well, I actually think we're seeing some signs that the possibility of bipartisanship on the deal the government says it had, particularly with the Liberal Party, may be fracturing. There are some coalition MPs who aren't happy with the deal and aren't happy with the increase to taxpayer support for the political parties at this time, particularly when both sides are talking about cutting budgets. Uh, there's one who's threatening to cross the floor. We understand that the overwhelming number of nationals